Hello there everyone and welcome back to TNO The Last of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mokalover. And right now we're playing as a Central Eurasian Provisional Authority of Project Gartha. Dimitri breathed in the freshest air he had ever smelled in his entire life. An icy breeze came from the massive mountains of Lhasa, accompanied by a sn light snowfall. The officials had begrudgingly given Dimitri and his crew permission to explore these wild peaks for the next month. The hour-long trip brought them to a large plateau in the hills, but there was still much ground to cover. Eurasia spared no expense in supplying them with the newest equipment available, and there was so much to see. For a second, Dimitri wanted to stay here. Russia was a smoldering mess, air polluted by decades of warfare, but here, he looked up at the gray sky. The, last, the lazy clouds were close now, and he felt as if he was on the, on the climb to heaven. But a job was a job, and he had to make the university proud. The team would soon approach Chodak, the last major settlement this high up, and after that, getting to the top of the cliffs was possible, but the professor felt a deep sense of dread as he stared at the jagged peaks like daggers waiting to impale some unfortunate climber. They would need help. Communications were still possible, so we could request helicopters from, from back home. They would get far, saving time. Alternatively, Choldock was rumored to be the home to many guides, but their array of skills come into price. Lastly, the team could attempt to brave the mountains by themselves, although Dimitri's training was limited to smaller heights in the Urals. Call the choppers and Eurasianism in the classroom. Class, it has come to my attention that many of you are not treating others the way you should. As you know, Eurasia is a very diverse nation. We use this diversity for our strength. It is not a weakness. Many of you refuse to see others as the same, and this cannot be cannot stand. Cooperation is the utmost is of utmost importance. If you're a Russian, don't help your just help your Russian neighbor, help your Tatar neighbor, or your Muslim neighbor. We're all Eurasians. From now on, I want you to treat your peers as you would want yourself treated. That means you too, Alex. But he pushed me first. Yes, and instead of punching him in the jaw, you should have come to me so I could have sorted it out, the teacher answered. It seemed as if the kids were not really getting the point. Perhaps you needed another approach. Now, maybe you don't think this is all necessary. You may be asking, why do I have to be nice to the kid who, that doesn't like me or look like me and the, or the weird kid across the street that I don't understand? You see, there's a point to all this. And what is that, said one of the young girls sitting in the front. The teacher's tone changed. You're not just working together to be nice or be friendly. Your survival and survival of the entirety of Eurasia depends on you. Well, the evil, barbaric Romano-Germans Romano -Germans wait along our borders searching for weakness. You see, if we do not work together, they will come here to destroy us. They will kill your parents and kill you. They will de destroy all that you love. The children stared wide-eyed at the teacher. One now looked like he was close to crying. The teacher spoke again more calmly and amiably. <clears throat> this time, of course. But you do not have to be afraid if you work together. The one weakness our enemies have is that they are divided. The Romano-Germanics enslave those who think they are lesser than them, the same as the Asiatic civilizations. The Atlanticists are in eternal competition, each wanting to be better than the other. Only Eurasians understand true cooperation, so go home. And when you come back tomorrow, make sure you help your classmates. You are dismissed. Well, that's one way to get the point across, and let's go ahead and start exerting influence in the Southern Urals. Nice, because we did do the finish... The political stuff, but the race for If you want to read about this, please go ahead. A new theater. Very nice. And we'll probably do a Project Solar Flare next. Lands of Chen, while not entirely part of Eurasia, are close enough to Mongolia to possess many artifacts from our Tengri ancestors. We should bribe local officials in the Shangxi province to allow a team of archaeologists and historians to explore their museums and ancient sites, then report their findings back to us. Project Agartha, Agartha Crossroads. Dimitri couldn't help but smile as he pulled up the last member of his team. The last three days were the most challenging of his life, but now they were here, on mountain peaks themselves. All around him, columns of rock and icy stretched, uh, our ice stretched to the skies, not unlike dancers celebrating their arrival. Although breathing here was difficult, Dimitri allowed himself a laugh. He had come so far, from the Battle of Moscow to the Great, to the Great Retreat, the Second Offensive, the betrayals. His mind slipped into a state of blissful ignorance, where nothing of the present mattered, or nothing but the present mattered. They were here, but there were many paths in oh so little time. The team could venture higher, the locals both low, inform them of a monastery perched atop a great mountain. The monks would be would offer them refuge and provide important information concerning old Eurasia. Alternatively, the team could travel forward into a mountain pass. They had some geological equipment. Perhaps the crags tell their stories of their own. Supposedly, there's another small village to the east, inhabited by hermits. It has limited contact with the world below. Um, I want to go to the monastery, because they've been there a while, and they should know everything there. Refuge will provide information about concerning old Asia. Yeah, we'll probably Eurasia, so we'll probably do that. Launch no. So, like usual, when we're playing is West Russia. 
And we have Omsk here. They usually, they, oh, they're, I think they're forced to go to war with these guys. So, once they go to war with those guys, they won't go to war with these guys. But, Monastery. Entering the Monastery was akin to the war's end, Dimitri thought. Fighting in the trenches against Soviets and monarchists, drenched in blood and mud. But at the end, a reprieve. When his division returned to Uslos, Uslosk, they were permitted to shower a rarity in the Russian wastes. The cold water washed away the dirt, but also memories of slaughter. So it was here. The monastery stood against the snowstorm outside, massive yet rank trinkle, dimly lit by overhanging lamps. It was a welcome break from the struggle to get here, and the monks were welcoming. The team spent the next week resting and learning of their faith. They only had one translator, but that was sufficient to understand the history of Tibet. As much as Dimitri ap appreciated the comfort, he had a mission to accomplish. Long conversations with the monks revealed that there was a valley nearby, where ancient things lay. Attempts to get the, mo the monks to elaborate on this statement only revealed that the team's stress. The mountain's mystics could cleanse their minds through intense mediation, and Dimitri silently admitted that he could use some help. However, the monastery held many ancient texts. It would take the team a week at least to decipher less than a fraction of them, but there's no doubt that they held information on the past. Um, hmm. Ancient things lay... I probably want to view the ancient text. Like that's probably the, probably the best thing to do. I, mean, I, want, I want to get our legitimacy to 100%. But sacred text. The writing of the scrolls took many days to, to decipher. Meticulous work, even with the help of monks, required every member of the team to participate. They ate little, but with every page turned the Russians, they felt their time running out. Stacks described trivial events, modern history, until <clears throat> a single scroll depicting the ancient Tibetan Empire. Dmitri doubted its accuracy, but the information was there. The map showed borders stretching from the Himalayas to Mongolian steppes. They had made the link. The next day, the monks woke up to find the em <laughs> library emptied, and not a single or sign of gratitude from the hurried guests. A piece of the past. Nice. Awesome. But the project against the wall. The people may die, but the land remains. Millions of Russians have perished, driven from their homelands, pushed to their fringe. However, the Ural Mountains stand tall, defined against the shifting tides of history. They are home to warlords, ancient caves, hostile forces, and hidden knowledge? Rumor speaks of the riches of Zatos, that within their vaults lie things other than guns. It is necessary to investigate the high peaks, to unearth whatever it may have. Informants speak of deposits led by old Russians from centuries ago, unfortunately. It is unlikely that our eastern brethren will give permission to investigate. We must assemble a strike force, pierce enemy lines, investigate the mountain's edges for clues of Eurasia, prepare the units. Oh boy, that's not good. But maybe we'll still win after I drink my water bottle. You might have heard a little squeak there. Cool. The Eurasian National Army, which we did, I think, read, read yesterday, so... Uh, if, I, if you'd like to read it again, please go right ahead, but establish a masterocracy. Soviet Marxism made countless mistakes, but the greatest of them all was the core of socialism itself, the attempted breakdown of the existing societal structure. The Bolsheviks thought their pro that their programs would lead to all Eurasian citizens becoming a homogeneous ethno-economic whole. Where did that lead them? To economic ruin, defeat at the hands of Germany, and the total collapse of their state. We had it wrong from the very beginning. Russia already had a functional socio-economic structure that served it well. Only the mistakes of the Tsars and the failure to extend the system to all Eurasia caused it to cease functioning correctly. This masterocracy must be re-established and society stratified along the correct economic lines again. The Tartar rides. Colonel Andreyev turned away from the exercises to keep an eye on the newest company under his command. He was met by the all-too-familiar sight of the commander riding towards him. The integration of Captain Akhmet Nitov's Cavalry was proving a difficult task, mostly due to the man's complete lack of experience with protocol and poor grasp of the Russian language still. The higher-ups were adamant on the value of mounted soldiers and insisted the new company's step instincts would yield valuable insights once attuned to the realities of modern combat. Andreyev was not convinced. <clears throat> Colonel Andreyev? What is it this time, Captain? We should go home. It'll rain soon in the ground here. It'll be very bad for your cars. Soft. Too soft. Something about the sincerity of the man compelled the colonel to consider his advice. The exercise was, after all, on the Tartar's home turf, not his. And he was glad he did. No sooner had he moved his men than the sky parted, as torrential rain poured down from over the exercise field. <clears throat> as the rest of the company tried desperately to keep dry in their defensive positions, Akhmetov ca kept his riders scouting for enemies, trusting his men to find good footing in between the muddy fields and the days after, when the rains had ended. Andreyev had every advantage he needed to emerge from the exercise as a clear victor, a good showing, and a final rest. The steppes of Mongolia are rumored to be the final resting place of Genghis Khan, the father of the first Eurasia. We should send over a team of scientists supported by some troops to hold up bandit attacks so that we may locate the corpse of the universal ruler. And it looks like we're going to win anyways. Awesome. A success. I wasn't actually expecting a success, but awesome. <clears throat> Yevgeny waited as his strike team searched the small abandoned facility that had remained unguarded, unguarded ever since the Eurasian forces had pushed the West Siberians into a retreat. 
After breaking through the West Siberian lines, the small force was able to sneak past the enemy deep into the Urals. Now, all they had to do was find something of use that I could bring back to the superiors. Find anything yet, he shouted, eager to get out and head home. We found a rifle, a couple pistols, a few grenades, but besides that, nothing of real interest, answered Victor, one of the strike team members. Really? You'd think a facility in Slatowski would have more uh, than that, responded Yevgeny, now looking disappointed. <clears throat> Looks like they knew we were coming and evacuated most stuff before we got here. Or, more likely, this place hasn't seen use in years. The team began to regroup. Hold on. Let me have a look at that rifle, said Yevgeny. Picking it up, he examined it carefully, weighing it in his hands. I haven't seen anything like this before. You think experimental? I guess so, sir. Nothing like, like we have back in Eurasia. Surely, you think that's enough, replied Victor? No, they wanted something less new. Yevgeny examined the rifle once more. Some paint here and a few touch-ups there should do the trick nicely. If it looks old, they'll take our word for it. Once we're done, it'll look like a believable ancient weapon from old Eurasia. We showed them. Nice. Even more legitimacy. We're at 90, but we lose 5 every month, so not bad. Could be worse. <clears throat> the next focus, maybe? Uh, uh, okay, so for this side, it's going to really hurt industrial expertise, which is, you know, not that bad. It, bad uh, agriculture, poverty, academic base, research facilities, and monthly pollution. Strict pollution. Oh, wait. Strict pollution regulations. That's kind of nice. And we'll get more equipment and research. Uh, expertise will go up here. Military factory, civility. Oh, this is so good to get. All this stuff is really good to get, so. <clears throat> Except exploitative taxation. You lose 0.5 or 50% political power. That's really god awful. So we're not doing that one. So we'll do probably industry of the hegemon. Without industry, Eurasia is less than nothing. We've inherited a land almost completely devoid of modern arms production, large scale mining, and heavy industry in general. If the Germans were to return now, our nascent state would crumble like a house built on sand. If you'd like to about a decrease in poverty, please go right ahead. Thankfully, with our recent territorial acquisitions, we no longer lack the means to establish the industry we do need. There are solid foundations for our national scale economy already here. Our economic ministry believes that we can attain the status of a regional power in fairly short order thanks to the sheer amount of resources present in our lands. Nice. And we go from 50 to 80% poverty to 25 to 50% poverty. Nice. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Ac Academia challenges Gumilyov. The dudes. Gumilyov swore as he read the paper. Some scientists in a feudal battle to defend their so-called honor denounced Eurasia. He wondered where their brains were. Of course, Eurasia was Russia's ultimate destiny. How can they be so blind, ignorant of history? He turned to the fireplace and contemplated burning the challenge altogether. The quest for a civil debate was an obvious jab at his credibility. A cowardly move to undo that for which millions died. The weak cannot be allowed to slay Eurasia, and not now when we are so close. But a thought flew into Love's brain. And for a moment, he hesitated. No point in lying to yourself. He knew that Eurasia might as well be a newborn concept. Although the military and government swore allegiance to the him, the peasants were so doubtful. Perhaps we can make the use of this opportunity. Lev fell back into his chair. If, hypothetically, my sides were to win these debates, it would entrench the concept. But the fire burned so brightly, and the secret police were only a call away. They forget their place? No, 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 no. The strong need not fear the weak. I was looking up info about him. And apparently, like, when he was doing his, his dissertation, I don't know, like, people were... Some guy was against him, or one of the professors was, or something like that. And because then he started speaking in Persian or something like that. I don't know. I was looking at the Reddit and people talking about actually Gumilyov and and as, like I said in the last video, how Eurasia isn't particularly shown in the correct light, perhaps. So challenge accepted. The hall quieted down as Gumilyov, flanked by four bodyguards, entered. The eyes of ancient professors and fearful students all fell upon him. A frail old man dressed in pre-war formal attire beckoned the leader to the stage. A court. Uh, <clears throat> A court-like podium had been erected, twelve chairs for each side, spaced out equally in the middle of the hall so that hundreds may observe the struggle for Russia's soul. Thinking this front seat, Lev observed his side. A collection of academics, mostly authors he had promoted, some students with too many ideas for their age, and two professors from time immemorial. On the other side, all respected historians, geologists, sociologists, and at their head, and writer of the letter, Alexander Nekrich. Gumilyov barely contained his rage. Stupid pigs, they dress in fancy suits and study each other's propaganda. Poor excuses for true historians. A crowd of 300 assembled around them and on the balconies above. However, one thing was yet to be decided, the judges. Lev Nikolaevich began Nikrich. We have selected five judges from our ranks. We assure you that they are without bias and will treat both sides fairly. He pointed to five professors sitting apart from the crowd. Gumilyov expected nominations to happen there and then. His mind scrambled to identify somebody on his side. They won't hand a candle to superior Eurasian will. Actually, I had some other minded men. Or some other men in mind. Try to bribe the judges? No. They won't hold a candle to superior Eurasian will. And Project Solar Flare? A shared legacy. But final rest as well. This looks like my dress at home, Las Laisan Karamova remarked as she looked at the dress on the display case. Traditional Tatar dress, like many other cultures, 
of the Eurasian steppe. Tartar folk costumes tend towards bright colors and elaborate embroidery, the label read. I know your family's dresses certainly are, her husband, Timir Karmarov, Karamov, smiled and nodded. Next up in the Kazan, all the Eurasian culture exhibition was a suit of armor which belonged to the chivalric Russian bogatir. Beside the armor of a Tartar warrior from the same period, the Karam... Karam... Oh my goodness. Karoma... Karomivaz. Oh, I apologize for my mispronunciations. Karomivaz. Pause to admire the craftsmanship of the two. Timer being, or Timer, being unable to do anything but stare at the bogatir armies he looked at the label below. Both Russian and Tatar armor of the Middle Ages reflect their common Eurasian heritage. The words bogatir is believed to be derived from a Turkic word meaning warrior. The cafeteria served bales, dumplings, and, oh, oh, how do you say this? Choi mock pancakes? Washed down with arion, yogurt mixed with cold, refreshing water. The couple talked about their favorite exhibitions, a favorite thing they learned from it, and all the similarities the Eurasian, Tartars, and Russians shared that they never noticed. But something was amiss, Timir thought to himself. For centuries, the Russians had persecuted the Tartar people, forced them to abandon their faith and ways. Now they were celebrating how similar they were? Was this some kind of a trick, or was something stranger afoot? The heritage of the steppes? And we'd have a cup of coffee to keep us nice and warm, but the right mind. Our current attempts aren't working. The people still believe Eurasia to be a foolish idea. No matter. The propagandists will be put to work, creating an intricate web of motive, objective truths, and white lies, buying us extra time to justify the concepts. As well as Old Mother. The Indian subcontinent, compared to our icy wastes, is a different planet. Admits seas of green where men haven't set foot in centuries, covered in icy or ivy and surrounded by monkeys. Lie the ruins of great civilizations. The Indian government should be negotiated with so that we can secure an expedition to unearth their hidden treasures. Coffee time. That's not quite 69 yet, but Eurasian statement. Gumilyov took the podium first, addressing the crowd. For centuries, Russia has suffered defeat after defeat. From Napoleon's campaign to the recent world wars, the spirit of both the Tsar and worker failed to save the people. The last three decades are testaments to the inadequacies of conventional geopolitics who have proposed a solution in Eurasia. My colleagues and I have recovered and studied texts, artifacts, tales, and natural evidence from a time when our Tengri ancestors roamed the steppes. During their rule, all peoples prospered. Russians, Kazakhs, Tartars, Europeans, too many to count. The recent successes of a regime are a testament to the righteous path on which we walk. I believe that Eurasia is the best choice for the people of Russia, based on recent history, archaeological evidence, and scientific findings. Firstly, I shall make the case for an ancient Eurasia, that in centuries past, life was better than it is now. I present the accounts of Slavic monks detailing Eurasian rule, archaeological evidence uh, linking the people to Eurasia, Ooh, cool. That's okay. Okay. a clarification of what it means to be too tengrist. One of my papers explains the Eurasian spirit. Slavic monks. Yeah. I'll do that one, since we don't lose legitimacy for everything else, which, oh boy, that's not good if we lose legitimacy. And output is not terrible. Seven a month. Or seven a, yeah, it's not too... Or seven a day, really, not bad. Opposition statement. Gumilyov felt his heart race as Nekrich took the podium. The crowd seemed more receptive of him. They smiled at his wave and applause from the back encouraged him. My friends, is it not true that Russia is a great nation? Is it not true that before the war we were at the forefront of science, industry, and art? Can any man here deny that they want to see their friends prosper? The old geopolitical views worked because they were the same. Because they were same. They advocated for a strong central authority for a country by Russians for Russians. It's only out of necessity that we service the Tartar. It is out of misfortune that we lost so much so quickly. I'm here to argue that Eurasia is a death trap and that based on the incompetence of its leader and misunderstanding of real world politics and very idea is quite horrid. I bring to light this last several years, Gubal Yav's regime, acting explicitly to restore Eurasia, has executed hundreds and committed unspeakable horrors upon their respectable enemies. My colleagues have already published a paper listing the injustices of the current regime. If it's allowed to survive, I fear we may be the last generation of true Russians. Should have shot that dude when I had the chance. Project Solar Flare or the new economy. The United Eurasia is and always has been. The strongest force in the world is a historic fact. That she very seldom has been united in another is another. Only the most extraordinary of wills could tame and harness the indomitable spirit of Great Eurasia. Lev Gumilyov possessed such a will. The implementation of a new economic plan would take him one step closer to his goal. All sectors of the economy had to be organized to take direction from the state. It was a necessary prerequisite to achieve the twin goals of economic modernization and popular mobilization. Dramatically increasing state interference would make him few friends in the higher classes, of course. He had long since been resigned to that fact, and his willingness to pay the price for other scorn was set long ago. He would have to deal decisively with the upper crust sooner or later anyways, for far too often. The poison of disunity could be traced back to some plutocrats seeking to profit from chaos. If he allowed industries to, co to operate outside state control, perfidious owners would undermine Eurasia to seek those profits for themselves or in service to tribalist traders for the good of the nation. <clears throat> Integration of the Hegemon. My apologies about that, everyone, but Project Solar Flare. 
Ranek expected the Shang-Chi trip to have taken longer, but he was surprised by how quickly they had arrived. Nina, Vlas, and himself had only been for a few days, and yet they explored many libraries, villages, and schools. But they were most excited for today, where they had been invited to the Shang-Yan Banpo Museum of Ancient Chinese History with artifacts dating back thousands of years. Walking around with an emigre guide, Ranek noted how some of the bowl bowls were slightly similar to those found back home. Nina commented on how the shape of one of the skulls was almost exact to those found at the Eurasian Bureau sites in northern Russia. Vlas, examining one of the illustrations of the ancient settlement, discovered how the structures seemed akin to those found in the Kazakh steppes, as well as connecting them to early Eurasian cities. I believe that what we have have seen here firmly plants the idea that Chinese history is directly connected to the history of Eurasia, said Ranek. The time periods are identical and similarities impeccable. The guide, now very confused, decided to speak up. I'm not sure if you noticed, but almost all these artifacts are from 6,000 years ago. The people didn't even know Eurasia existed, much less China. I'm sorry, ma'am, said Nina, but we're historians and the connections between these structures here in early Eurasian cities are astounding. You historians, the guide sputtered. I create a, a museum, and only the only cities at the time were nowhere near Russia. Well, new discoveries are being proven every day, said Ranek. And today we've proven that China is de jure part of Eurasia, just as we thought. And with that note, the group excited, exited the museum and made their way to the next attraction, just as expected. <laughs> That's funny. I like that one. I'll probably do Old Mother next, so. We love India. The Mughal legacy. I, I need to study more about Indian history. That'd be kind of cool. Eurasian argument. Gumilyov rested. Uh, returned to center stage and forced a smile. The old crowd did not cheer, and he thought he spotted looks of disgust on some faces. Sighing, he continued, My opponents have yet to come up with a single thing that the old Russia did right. <clears throat> the Tsars enslaved their subjects, imposed cruel taxes, and fought in wars they couldn't have possibly win, just to resolve petty disputes among nobles. The Soviets were a little better. The Reds slaughtered all who disagreed with them, tried to destroy nature itself, and for what? So that the romano germanists could take it all away? The Russian people will never achieve anything by themselves. Only when the children of the steppes unite will they see the light of day. My government exists to facilitate the unification. We do not squabble over resources that all can share. We do not appease dissidents, and we are the descendants of the greatest people to ever exist. The current regime is but a small peek into the future. Does anyone regret fighting for Eurasia? We, who have overcome the Reds, monarchists, traitors, and Finns, shall rise again. Look at what we've accomplished in the past few years. Eurasia gave you prosperity, honor, knowledge, northern, our northern lands back. Um, technically, prosperity is correct. We did improve our poverty rate, so... Knowledge... Eurasia give you your northern lands back. Let's go with prosperity. Because uh, people might not care about land, but prosperity might be really good. Because technically we did get prosperity, so that might, that makes sense, right? So we're doing now this. It is 1967. All this stuff needs to be done. Resources would be good to do as well. We're done with the stuff so far. We probably want to keep going down with trucks and just infantry equipment. Or just military equipment, period. So, um, But industry is still good. Opposition argument. Nice. Nekrich retook the stadium. Uh, smirking as he passed by his leader, the crowd let out a weak cheer. He continued, What my opponent fails to understand is that the system has been tested and failed. I don't think there's anyone left in Russia, even with mon within monarchy circles, who believes that a fully aut autocratic nobility means prosperity. And what is sustainability, turned to Gumilyov? How will you run the state if your people are all slaves? How can you, in a conscious and sound mind, advocate for a pagan faith from the Gobi Desert, while Eurasia wouldn't even be able to reclaim the lost motherland? Its army would be too busy riding horses around to realize what a rifle is. The crowd broke into laughter. Eurasia's victory against the other warlords was simply a tactical blunder on their part. There were many times when a weak state could have been overrun, save by pure chance. Why should we fix what isn't broken? Look at history, capitalism, representation, even socialism worked to an extent. How is some archaic parody of a country supposed to bring about prosperity for its people? And all the academics too. Cool. Old mother. And finish your coffee here too. Oh, maybe. The wind wet, wind swept step. Grave news. Last month, the team was stealthily dispatched to the plains of Mongolia on a secret mission. Hidden under the cover of night, our units evaded patrols and entered the Gobi Desert. Their mission was clear. Find the remains of Genghis Khan. According to legend, when the great conqueror died, he was buried in an uncharted part of the desert. The grave had no markings and was ridden over by horses. Those who buried him were slain upon completion of the task. Although Mongolia is large, the search was limited to certain places based on ancient writings. The archaeology team had to fend off bandits, Red Army remnants, and local units. The search lasted for over three weeks. See page 19 on Area Scoured. Local legends were consulted, but no corpse was ever found. The team was forced to withdraw through the Central Asia due to increased military presence near the search sites. He remains asleep and far flung.
Vietnam is distant, but it was once a priority target for the old Eurasians. We should dispatch an envoy and negotiate developmental aid in exchange for a team of archaeologists to visit the old French colony. Eurasian rebuttal. The debate resumed after a hostile outbreak, or a hostile break. Two fist fight broke out in the cafeteria. A full riot was stopped only by the bell. Gumilyov knew his position was weak, even if he were to win the intellectual battle. Few peasants were smart enough to look past the outlandishness of his rightful ideology. So, once everyone returned to position, he continued. Critics of Eurasia can only blabber on about sustainability and buried ideologies. However, they are wrong. The peoples of Eurasia are the strongest in the universe, for they have each other. The blood of the Mongols courses through our veins. We are heirs to a great legacy. These intellectuals who call themselves these men who call themselves intellectuals are blind to your struggles. They sit behind wealth in rusted buildings surrounded by outdated concepts. Hear me, do you not wish for a greater meaning? Is there not a person here who will shy away from destiny itself? When life knocks, beckoning us to the past through which we may have the future, will be shy away from the challenge of retreating, retreating, yeah, retreating to the comforts of history? A new order calls us to upturn the world and throw away the yoke of the step upon those who did us wrong. The future waits. Lead us back to Moscow? Uh... Shed the chains that bind us onwards for our Tengri ancestors? Hmm. We'll shed the chains that bind us. Eurasia will lead us back to Moscow. Let's do that one. I like to be, even though someone, This seems like if we get something now, we'll get even more penalized later. So we'll see what happens. We can still do all this stuff too. Disorder in the court. Gumilyov finished his statement, but before he could make it back to his chair, something hit him in the head. Quickly, he looked down to see a small stone. The hall descended in chaos, guards rushing against the mass of humanity. Angry yelling broke into the cries of battle. Fear for Eurasia yelled some brute as he picked up and threw an old man at the woman next to him. <laughs> Puffs of smoke rose up as Gumilyov dodged more stones. The opposition distressed chose retreat. His teammates gave chase before bodyguards seemed to evacuate the leader. By the end of the day, half of the university had burned down and 50 people were injured the next day. Gumilyov received a protest from Nekrich, accusing his men of facilitating a raid. He demanded that Gumilyov return tomorrow to finish the debate. I didn't order those attackers. Write a firm apology to those who were involved. Accuse the opposition of staging the raid. Honestly, this seems like they staged it. Um, I would, I would probably do this one, but I didn't order those attackers, really, so. That seems like it could go really well, poorly for us. Um, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Because yeah. we didn't do anything here. They threw stuff at us. <sighs> Opposition rebuttal. The hall was a shell of its former self. A large hole now decorated the ceiling, and the remains of two balconies littered the floor. A new hastily erected podium stood before some 80 people. The opposition was half the original number. The judges seemed worn out, and one had a nasty bruise from around the left eye. Nekrich menacingly eyed Gumilov as he continued the last day's speech. And for these reasons, my opposition's argument is null and void. The debate was over, and the judges retreated to decide the victor, and the winner is... Russia, or Eurasia. Let's go and do small business as state business. The main driver of Atlantis's social mobility is a middle class. He begins innocently enough. A man finds some success at a small time merchant. He becomes wealthy enough to purchase a shop of his own. In time, he begins to think of himself as above his station, merely because of his material wealth. Such is the manner in which Atlantis's values subvert the natural order of Eurasia. It is always the middle class, born from small business, that forments. Uh, Foments revolution and dilutes our core cultural values. There's room for merchants in Eurasia, but not as an independent and wealthy class of their own. Perhaps ta heavy taxation and a mountain of red tape will get the message across. Let's we'll see what happens. We have a lot of deficit. But, oh well, it is what it is. Eurasia loses. What? The taste of defeat is always bitter. But at least Gumilyov, uh, Gumilyov retained his superior supporter base. The opposition walked away triumphant, but by only a slim margin. Gumilyov retired to his home for the day. He had a lot to work to do. The minor academics must be purged. The untouchable is discredited. The concept rebuilt piece by piece. A dream delayed? Well, we'll see about that. Alright, everyone. So, instead of doing Far Flung earlier, I actually went ahead and did the Indian one with Project Old Mother, India's Request. The Indian subcontinent is full of marvels, ranging from the remains of ancient civilizations to, many, to its many faiths, to its heritage and legacy, its people are unaware of the status within Eurasia. Our scientists have located an ancient Mughal fortress from a time before Atlantis dominated India. Perched high above a mountain amidst areas a sea of jungles. Maintained by nature alone, the place must be home to many artifacts. Indeed, the local government has responded to our interest, offering to accommodate an archaeology team. Unfortunately, the nearby villages are poor. The people there lack electricity and running water. Obtaining food from the nearby forests is a dangerous task. Delhi refuses to provide adequate support to this backwater province, so a trade has been organized. The locals have hinted that we need to send over a gift in the form of developmental aid. Failure to do so within a week may lose their attention, locking us off from the fortress. Equipment help the village hunters. Fun local projects. Um, we could give them equipment then, but fun local projects. Uh, 
Village Hunters. That's fun local projects. Eh, we could try that one. Maybe? Equipment seems pretty good, though. Uh, electricity and running water. Give him modern equipment. Do that one. Steal me. So both sides stood in silence as the judges eyed each other. Although the fifth judge was technically the tiebreaker, either the, the reasoning of both sides or yesterday's events made him re reconsider whatever decision had previously been made. Refusing to name a winner, the two sides stormed off. Returning home, Lev breathed a sigh of relief. He expected the academics to berate him, to demand more time-wasting arguments, but they remained silent. Many will take the silence as a defeat on their part, he considered. At least for now, the concept is secure. It, was, it has withstood both war and scrutiny a hundred years to Eurasia. And I totally didn't go back and bribe the judges. Totally didn't do that. Absolutely not. Oh, man. Fake news. But let's continue with... Uh, I think I already read this one, so if you want to read this one again, please go right ahead. But at least we're okay. We're still doing the one about getting a skunk again, which is totally fine. Barflung, we read about that. Success! Old, uh, pro oh, nice. Cool. We'll read about that just very soon. Let's get some more land and attack. But Project the Mother. Uh, the local government has secured its funding and allowed our expeditionary force to enter the Mughal fortress. Ascending the mountain wasn't easy, but losses were minimal. The gates were locked and rusted, but the team gained access to the collapsed western wing, the attachment. Most of the citadel's contents had weathered through the ages, likely left alone for over three centuries. The armories were empty, but no records survived to explain this. No valuables survived, likely robbed by the locals years ago. Within the fortress, the team located a large room protected by a ten-foot-tall steel door. Explosives were authorized, revealing an untapped treasure room. Hundreds of coins, artifacts, precious metals, and pottery now are in transit to our facilities in Vyatka. Most important of all, we found arms from the Caucasus. We assume them to have belonged to ancient Russian mercenaries or explorers, but this is well, this will only f reinforce the idea of United Eurasia, treasures of Eurasia. Very good. And we're at hundred percent. So, what do we do? What do we do now? So, do we not want to do this immediately, every single time? Because, um, okay. I guess we do it every single time, because that's a lot. So I do have a question here, like, if we do this, increases our legitimacy by five, can we do this repeatedly? Probably not. The wind swept changes. Uh, so if you want to read this about this one again, this is happening earlier, so if you want to read about this again, please go right ahead. He remains asleep, though, fortunately. So, okay. From owners to managers. Even though our place in the lower rungs of society is now guaranteed, we simply can't get rid of ourselves or the services they provide to the populace. Our economic ministers approach Gumilyov with a sublime thought, one that will act as illusory appeasement and also tighten our grip on the economy. All these new restrictions and regulations, they're a problem for your struggling business, aren't they? Well, perhaps we can lift a few of them, ease up the taxation if you agree to a voluntary buyout. So you'll become subservient to the Eurasia-friendly corporation, so what? Your job description will change from owner to manager, and you'll have your freedom back. Is that so high a price? Oh, there goes England and Wales. The invasion of the Southern Urals. England and Wales at war. If you want to about this, please go ahead. So because of this, well, I believe we got to get involved. So we will go to war with the West Siberian Provisional Authority very, very soon. Get, let Oms give some time to get really invested in fighting down here. Move their armies and generals around first. Um, I don't like that. That the legitimacy here just has to go down. I really don't like that, so... Regional development, I think down there. Um, yeah. And we already have boosted our military spending and civilian spending because we have a lot of deficit, but whatever. Give us a few days first. Oh, and there goes Wales. Get them very involved, the letter. Glovis Ivanov stood behind the counter watching those walking by and making sure no thieves snuck out his doors. His grocery business was starting to see real success, and he was even thinking of opening a second store. He had really built himself up, and that was something, as as, as most stores in Shadow Russia did not do too well. Mr. Ivanov, I found a letter next to your table. Do you want to look at it? His clerk, Prov, asked. Ah, uh, yes, that. Something from the government, I believe, replied Clovis. You can just leave it here. Ripping the letter open, Clovis didn't know what to expect. Had he forgotten to pay part of his taxes? Perhaps a misinspection, but as he began to read, it was much 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 worse than any of that. Dear Mr. Ivanov, and to who it may apply, we are to inform that you of your business is being nationalized. Please hand over the keys and required documents to the official who will be coming next Monday. If you wish to remain in the business, you must reply to become a member of the Passionary and transfer your position to manager. We thank you for your cooperation. He shop nationalized. That couldn't be right. He just owned a little grocery, not a corporation. Perhaps it was just an error? But as it turned out, when he read the morning paper and talked to the other shop owners on the street, it was not. The shop was now owned by the government, and the, now he was just the manager, for the good of old Eurasia and top-down economic management. Liberal capitalism is ephemeral and foolish. The Ant Atlanticists uh, have shown us the kind of economic disasters that occur as a result of unrestrained plutocrats running wild. Perhaps if they had kept their pigs panned up, they wouldn't have lost to the Germans. Eurasia will avoid the same mistakes. Only the state has proven members of the national elite should have the right to manage substantial sums of money. True ideologies, or ideologues, can surely be trusted to set aside their materialist desires and do what is best for the nation. Better consumer goods? Yes, please. And how long do we have to wait till we have to intervene? Ooh, a little while. That's not bad. Well, let's go down a little bit more first. 
Oh, look, I'm getting more and more involved. I want a lot of these guys to die off. So, three theses. Okay, they have 51,000 manpower. Up to 23 divisions. Not bad. Get them very, very involved. And we're just going to go jutting right on in. And it's time to go. The aggression must be punished. Strike them directly. Thank you, Omsk. Immediately go in. Scour them. Skewer them. What do we do to them? Beat them up. Smoke them. Smoke them out. Well, we've lost 2,000 versus 6,000 so far. 7,000. Nice. Not bad. Oh, are we losing here? That's not good. Nope. Oh, Alright, we lost that one. That sucks. Uh, and make sure that we don't need to do that. Keep going, keep going. We have as much manpower as need to be, and once we get these guys, it'll be very good for us too, so... Not super too worried about that. Better industrial expertise. If you like to read about that, please go right ahead. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Even though we can still use more arty. Oh, that's not good. Minus 1100. Not good. Eurasia giveth, Eurasia taketh away. Oh boy. That's not good. Yuri Mayandin was Nenets, and his people had suffered in the past for not being considered true Russians. They were not Russians. The Nenets were their own people, and the Eurasianists recognized that. The Eurasianists didn't try to impose the Russian language on Mayandin's people, nor did they try to ban them from serving in government and military positions. The Nenets and other West Siberian minorities had the same rights and the same opportunities as any other citizen of Eurasia. Of course, being equal to the other races didn't mean much, considering how the Eurasianists organized their society. Things were so stratified and so authoritarian. It was deeply concerning to many within Mayadin's community. A lot of Russians made up the elites because they had the most resources when the Eurasianists arrived, with class mobility almost non-existent. Mayadin had trouble finding a way to advance his people's status. Maybe if he joined the military, he could climb the ranks and ensure that Russians didn't ruin the Eurasianist experiment. They would just have to accept that Eurasia meant was meant for all of its people, not just one of them. If the Russians won't give us equality, then we must take it by force. Alright, so let's take a look here. They are they still have some good old manpower. We are running out of equipment fairly quickly here too, which is very bad, but we're still doing fairly okay. Refuge in mediocrity. Oh boy. It was another long, hard, dreary day for Clovis Ivanov. Barely any customers had visited his store that day, and even less had made a purchase. His new co manager, Laver Laver, barely cared for the job at all. It seemed all he did was report what Clovis did to his higher-ups, and to th just think, a few months earlier he was thinking of expanding his business, now the government was driving it to the ground. Not like Laver or any of the other business experts cared. They just reported good numbers and that was that. It is what you get when you make a bunch of bureaucrats running a business after all. Clovis knew there was nothing he could do about it. It's not like he could leave, and even if he could, Clovis knew he could never live to see his business that he built from the ground up destroyed by Laver and his lackeys. Well, let's go pause this one here real quick. He didn't even miss... He even missed back when the democratic socialists were in charge. At least he didn't butt their heads into his business as much. And they didn't fire prob. He looked down at the sales for the day. Even last than last week, and an order from form that Lavar was supposed to go supposed to do didn't get built out. Great. He filled the order and gave the sales report to Laver to check for mistakes. He nabbed a loaf of bread for his family before walking out the door. He should be glad, at least he still has a job. Let's go and pause the attacks because we've lost twenty five thousand versus sixty thousand. Yeah, it's about two to one, not bad. Let's get some more planning done. Guys, don't worry about that too much. Yeah, don't worry about that. Just hang out for now. Hang out for now. We build ourselves up. Get some more max planning done. That'll be good. 90. Now it's pan Asianism. We could probably do that. And then we'll do fuel the fires. We can get more fuel, but we don't really need to. More military factories actually be pretty good right now. So, a strong military industrial complex is necessary for us to match our international rivals, but the influence of private corporations is a matter of great concern to our guide. German, American, and Japanese co corporations have all flooded impoverished nations with cheap weapons to keep themselves in the green, green during peacetime. As a result, they hold disproportionate influence around the globe. We cannot tolerate our own arms manufacturers similarly, enriching themselves at the expense of the nation. While the Eurasianist elite are generally trustworthy, arms production is too dangerous and industry to be left in their hands. The state will retain the exclusive right to produce arms and ammo of all types with no exceptions. Oh, they actually attack us? Look at that. Nice. Good. They really want to attack us. The Great Trial above and their out of map are good. Integrating the bourgeoisie. Vadim Kozinov stepped into this a spacious room where Lev Gumilyov had sat waiting on a comfy sofa. Vladim, you're here earlier than I expected. Have a seat, said Gumilyov joyfully. Greetings, Lev. Now I know you want to get straight down to business as I do. The situation of the economy is very urgent, after all. I have a few ideas how we could fix the utter mess that we are in. In fact, I have a few ideas as, as well, Vladim. I want it very well-rounded. A new take on the co command economy, perhaps, Gumilyov uh, replied. <clears throat> yes, as I told you before. A command economy is best for our current situation. We must make as much action as possible if we want it to grow. Vadim paused for a moment to think. It may be a good idea to take full control of the resources. Many private companies are not working at full efficiency nor capacity. We should probably and could probably organize better than they could. A great idea, Vladim. 
uh, of Vadim Gumilyov's mod. West Russia was all his, and there was so many opportunities. We also had to make sure to control the factories. Too many are low on workers, or their owners just don't manage them well enough. Meanwhile, small businesses offer very little support to our economy. Nationalizing them, I can feel, be very beneficial, don't you think? Well, Vadim looked down at his papers, then back up at Love. We'll see if that's necessary, Love. Another pause, and Love Gumilyov's small falters. You know what? I th I th I'll put it on the plan and talk it over with some of the others. It's a good deal for sure. But some of them might not see it that way, though. Do what it takes to make sure it happens, Vadim, and of course, it is a great idea. What better way to improve the economy than that? West Russia will prosper within a year. <clears throat> Hopefully. Hopefully. Race for the Urals, can we do anything here? No, not really. Good. Exclusive right in the factories or the front lines. We are not so obsessed with our ideology as to be blinded to reality. <clears throat> While conscription is important for maintaining our strength, not everyone is suitable for military service. That said, there is no room for draft dodgers or indolent wastrels in our society. If a man cannot serve on the front lines, then he can serve in the factories. Eurasian industry always needs more able hands, willing or otherwise. Nice. Industrial expertise will continue to go up, and they're still attacking us, so I'm kind of okay with that. And we're still at 90, which is not bad, but not great. Yeah, we're really lacking a lot of RD, so. And anti-tank. A lot of anti-tank, actually. A lot, 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 lot of that. We're making a lot of that stuff up there, too. Nice, not bad. Let them attack us. Let them waste their men. Do we have any upgrades for our soldiers? Why we fight? Eh, nothing really. These are ranger. That's nice. And you guys are okay as well. So, the Russian people were once proud warriors, born in the steppes of Eurasia and unsullied by the weakness of civilization, said the film narrator, as men in costumes rode across the plain. The graininess of the film made it impossible to see how the cobbled together their Eurasian robes were, but it mattered little to the soldiers who watched, entrenched, or entranced by the recreation of their ancestral life. However, far to the west, there existed men as far weaker, far more degenerate than they, than they, who planned to seize the richest of the steppe for themselves. The film switched to footage of fat nobles gorging themselves on luxuries. The soldiers winced, not realizing how over the top the aristocrats were grabbing food from the table and eating with their mouths wide open before it switched to an angle of Peter the Great. It was Peter the so-called Great, who led Russia's descent into degeneracy. Believing the decadence of the Romano-Germanics to be strength, he introduced their ways into Russia, beginning centuries of decay. Then the Bolsheviks, who introduced egalitarianism into Russia, spoiling a once-proud people with the promises of comfort. The result was inevitable. The film showed old footage of panzers crossing the border into the Soviet Union. The Romano-Germanics saw their chance and struck deep into the heart of the Eurasian steppes, still holding many of her sons today. Is this the world you wish to see? The proud warriors of the steppes enslaved by decadent Romano-Germanics? Even those des des descendants of the steppes embrace that slavery? No, 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 came the cry of the men. The simplest techniques can be the most effective. Nice. So the factories or the front lines. Hey, they want to keep attacking. That's fine with us, but we're going to keep spending, so. Nice. Oh, 90. Oh, it's going to go down very soon, too. Oh, boy. 6.9% annual growth, not bad. The exclusive right. And, ah, land not attack. Very good. Get even some more defense or better guns. Ah, uh, 10% more so Oh, God, 10%. That's a really nice number. 10% is very good. You want to get, probably attack there and do well. Yeah, there you go. Do you actually do well here, too? Maybe? Maybe not. We'll see. I want to at least circle one division. It's only a militia division, but, you know, it's better than nothing, I guess. Ah, they do attack us there. Very good. And spanner in the works. Who wants to be in circle these guys? Oh, come on, man. Come on. As Ivan Rubinovich turned the corner towards the front entrance of the factory he managed, he was immediately met with a sight that he had not been expecting, even in his wild imaginations. A large group of Eurasian National Army troops standing guard outside the front gates, complete with military vehicles blocking the roads. What the bad word? He cursed under his breath as he pulled over to the side of the road. As Ivan hastily exited the car, he immediately noticed a tree of soldiers coming towards him. The rifle slung over their shoulders, and their steely expressions did not imply their intentions were benevolent. You, are you the one in charge here? The soldier in front, clearly an officer, calling called out as his squad drew closer. Yes, I am, and I demand to know what's going on. Even as the soldiers began to surround him, Yvonne's confused anger entailed a certain degree of recklessness. This factory has been repurposed in the name of the Eurasian state, as ordered by our leader. I'm afraid the days of un unpatriotic nomad merchants like yourself getting fat off the riches of the Eurasian people are over. Nomad merchants? Just what the heck are you implying? My family's owned this factory for generations, you bad word. Yvonne's protests were brought to an abrupt conclusion when a rifle butt struck him in the face, sending him tumbling to the ground. Dumb, bad word Jew, the officer snarled. Put him in cuffs and throw him in the truck. We'll take back our industry one way or another and fuel the fires. The soil and stone of Eurasia hides more than just the bones of our forebears. Pulled in the depths of the unearth, uh, of the earth as a veritable bounty boil, here to, heretofore unexploited. The fires of war call for even more fuel. Let us provide it. Operations will commence in Samara, Ukta, and anywhere else we can find this precious black gold. Recent events have proven that great powers live and die by the oil supply. Eurasia's future demands that we squeeze every drop from our soil. Go in. It's time we go in. It's time we do it.
It's time to end this menace once and for all. The Omsk menace. We've lost 50,000. Well, we could have 138,000. That's okay. We'll get more core people over here, so. That's alright. We'll do well, hopefully. Hopefully. Beat them all up. Kill every single last one of them. No peace with these types of folks. Oh, we captured the arms plant. If you want to read about that, please go right ahead. Forward. And the automotive plant, too. Onward's countrymen. Great. Great, great, great. There you go. If you want to circle these guys, that would be great as well. There you go. Cool, 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 cool. They attack us. That's fine with us. And we attack them right on back. Air superiority is doing hopefully quite well up here. Factories of the front lines? No, nothing really down there. Okay, well, whatever. Oh, do you guys not have orders? Oh, we probably can't reach the uh, group there. Probably right. Yeah, air wing, air wing cannot cover the army. And fuel the fires. Followed up with what? Oh, anti-conscription protests in the countryside? Uslisovsk is in flames. Citywide protests have extended into the countryside. Where eligible adults for the draft are blocking streets, fighting civilian police, and causing property damage. Cries of I will not die for Eurasia and no power for the passionary are being shouted in unison against the rising smoke and ever-encroaching sound of military trucks. With a screeching halt, elite divisions of the military have been deployed to protest sites, along with remnants of the local police garrison. The crack of rifle gunpowder, PPSH fire, and the whipping of police batons would end these protests in a matter of minutes amid a few screams and more scuffles. The majority of protesters were detained and now at the mercy of the military. An officer stepped out of a military truck with a loudspeaker and walked to face a crowd. Attention by engaging in today's gross protests against the state of Eurasia. Every perpetrator has officially been charged with high treason by the orders of the guide of the Passionarist Revolution, Lev Gumilyov. However, he is willing to give mercy to those who will work for the advancement of the state in their factories. If you do not want to be tried against the court, walk forward. With a few worried whispers, an old man was the first to rise and began to walk towards the officer. A few moments later, most others in the crowd would walk towards the officer and several soldiers. Whatever awaited the rest of, was certainly a worse face than factory duty. The lazy and cowardly will be swept into use for the state and state resource monopolies. Witness our enemies and how they foolishly place their strategic resources in the hands of the private ind individuals. What madness grips the Romano Germanics or R Romano Germans and Atlanticist souls that they consider this to be wise? They only hasten their downfall by ceding power to resource barons and wealthy shareholders. However, there is a place for private corporations in the resource industry. At the side of the state bureaucracy, the state will hand out contracts for extraction and refinement so that every corporation and concern has a b chance to prove its value. The, va the best of the lot will be duly rewarded with further contracts, binding them ever closer to the apparatus of the state state. Nice. How are we doing? Are we doing okay? Oh, guys, you don't need to worry about these guys. We'll deal with them later on. How many men do we lose? 100,000 probably? Oh, 65,000. That's bad. Ah, the gulag. Sometimes great men do most awful things. Yep, and that's okay. Keep going, guys. Actually, how many divisions? Do I well, they look really weak in some areas. 17 divisions left. Not bad. Nice. Basic motorized is very good. And hopefully... World War III does not start. Is, are they still fighting down there? Holy crap! Well, the only time I've ever seen something like this happen is when... When I or, you know, when everyone else plays as, you know, South Africa or the United States helping them out. That's the only time I've ever seen so this South Africa get this huge. I haven't done anything off screen to help them out. Like, holy crud. This is the first time I've ever seen these guys do this well. God, hold on. Before we do that, ben, it's Bennett, right? Bennett's leading, yeah. Um, How... How much war support do they not have? Very worrying domestic discontent. Oh, oh boy. Oh man, that's nice. Token civil rights, somewhat high unity. Great. State resource monopolies, cool. And how are we doing for this legitimacy? It's not very good. Can we get any more legitimacy at all? Like, this, this kind of sucks, I'll be honest. Go straight for Omsk. Um, I guess we could do denounce the Romano Germanics. Cool. We've lost about 80,000 versus a quarter million. That's not bad. 3 to 1 casualty ratio. Uh, we'll like that. Hey, good job, guys. Surgut. Surgut. Alright, I guess next. For the state's prosperity? No. A responsible economic authority? Yes. The new economic elites are a double-edged sword, although generally trustworthy, owing to their ideological indoctrination, and greed has proven a powerful catalyst for treachery in the past. If wealth is power and power corrupts, then we could very easily have a problem in our hands. Of course, we aren't so short-sighted and envious as the Bolsheviks. A solution is not to strip the elite of their wealth, but to encourage their close ties with the apparatus of state. That way, our bureaucrats can monitor their activities and ensure they aren't abusing their position. Better still, by tying their well-being to that of the establishment, they will develop a vested interest in remaining loyal and following orders, which is very good. How are you not dead yet? Guys, guys, what is going on here? Are you actually defeated here, huh? Kill them. 
And what do we have here? The far flung? Oh, might as well do that Vietnam. Oh, let's wait a little bit. Let's wait a few days. Ah, we can do some of this stuff. Good. Expertise, facilities, base, agriculture, weekly manpower. Ah, we're kind of okay on that one. We gotta save our PP anyways, so. State resource monopolies. The decree. Decree 5014. Nationalization of all resources in Eurasia dictated by Lev Gumilyov. The immediate nationalization of all resources within Eurasia will now begin. All mines, cores, and mineral resources will now belong to the state, including coal, oil, steel, tungsten, and aluminum. All private companies that will operate in gathering these resources and more must immediately give their management over to the state. If control is not handed over within one month, the state will take forceful action. If you are an owner or manager of any of these operations, you may be entitled to remain with some limited control. No change will be expected by the workers. We thank you for your cooperation to bring success and prosperity to Eurasia. The resources in Eurasia belong to all Eurasian peoples. Cooperation brings strength. Let's get our economy rolling. Go in. Kill these guys off. Seriously, kill them off. This is taking way too long for this. Oh, look at that. They actually beat him up. Wow. That actually happened. Peace at last, but at what? It's, now that was... Wow. Like... Oh, can't do that one yet. Let's do this one. Um, that was definitely a Vietnam for America then. Like, holy crap. Until 67? Jesus Christ, that took so long. Just like this. It's taking forever too. How did you not win here? How? How in the world do you not win here? Force the attack. Kill them all off. Come on. Go, go, go. Seriously, that is pathetic. Our soldiers are pathetic. With air superiority, no, nonetheless? Come on, guys. With so much advanced development on our land auction, too. I don't care if these guys get encircled or not. I really don't. The Red Twilight? Oh, there you go. I'm oh, sorry, I, I just... Whenever you see that, it just... It always happens like that, so... Seriously, kill them off. Kill them off. I don't know why these guys are so pathetic. That took way too long. Holy crap. What the heck? And now, let's go ahead and integrate all these places. There's a lot of PP, some stability, but whatever. Uh, over here, we're going to get some more construction speed, equipment. Uh, infrastructure is going to do that. It's fine. Equipment, poverty rate, of course. Professionalism. Nice. Now, that's good. Now, we're out of PP. Oh, we have more divisions, though? Oh, cool. As we should, because these guys suck so hard, apparently. For some reason. I don't know why. Just, we have almost our land auction. Almost. Not all of it. But almost all of our land auction done and completed. Um, we also have... I guess we could use some more military improvements, but still. like A lot of that meant no, made no sense why we were losing so badly. I made sure our divisions were nice and thick. But, holster... Holist, oh, holistic economic order. So other nations, even superpowers, tend to make the same mistake over and over again. They think that economic and social policies are different things. Time and time again, we've seen where such things lead. The result is invariably either revolution or takeover by the mighty, over mighty middle class. Either way, traditional social harmony is destroyed. Our guide understands that there should be no distinction between these two policy areas. A holistic approach to our socio-economic order will ensure ideological coherence and keep everyone in their proper place. Nice. And now we gotta deal with these guys. Uh, let's see. Race for the girls. Yeah, we might as well do that. For 75 days, we'll just go straight to war with them. And just both of these guys, so. And then feed the world that matters. The downfall of nations begins with empty stomachs. Merchants, particularly of the parasitic kind, are the ones to blame for this. First, they, have, they offer the destitute farmer a great a good place for his harvest. He takes the offer, becoming a willing stooge of liberalism. Then the merchant gouges the city folk, selling grain at a high price, just enough to impoverish them even further. If they cannot pay, then he takes his wares across the border, becoming a traitor to his nation. Naturally, we will enforce strict laws to prevent this sorry situation from ever happening again. Eurasia must attain absolute agricultural autarky so that no matter what else happens, we will never face a revolution born from starvation. Those who work try to sell foodstuffs outside the approved markets and above the approved price will face severe consequences. Good. You can keep boosting if you want. Cut spending, actually, for now. We should do okay against these guys, but you never know. You really just never know. Are you suffering because you are training, or... Oh, we do need to get rid of that division, too. I'll probably convert these divisions to, like, actual tanks eventually, so... And then, National Food Dole. As an additional measure to keep the plebs happy, we should take note of minor Bolshevik success, the Food Dole. Every good Eurasian citizen, no matter their status, should be able to eat. A portion of all harvest will therefore be placed in care of the Eurasian food bank, so that nobody will ever go hungry in a great society. There's no need to go as far as Atlantis' counterparts though, might, though. The Eurasian commoners of peasant stock, he only needs the grains and vegetables native to his homeland. Meat, alcohol, and other such things are luxuries best left to the deserving. And let's go ahead and do... Uh, denounce the Eurasianists? Oh! Oh, uh, whoops, my bad. I should have done this way earlier. I forgot about this. But 70's not bad. 
70 is pretty good, right? Oh, GD Unifies and Faris? Okay, not so bad. And what happens here? At 70, I mean, that's so bad, Eurasia thrives. The ground product is born fruit. The general opinion has swung in favor of Eurasia for the first time since its foundation. Though there was much work left to be done, we can confidently advance into the east and west without fear of an eternal uprising. Today, Russia today, Eurasia tomorrow. Look at that. We get Eurasia dominant. More political power, division, organization, recovery rate, stability, war, sport, construction, speed, factory, output, and ideology of defense. 70%. Not bad. That's really good. Oh, there's some severe... Oh my god, what's lagging so hard? Oh, what was going on there? Uh, consumer goods... Yeah, drop that one. There you go. Oh, do we have more free military factories? Good. So what are we lacking then? Anti-tank. Even artillery is looking good. But we need a lot of anti-tank. And more planes, of course, but anti-tank first. There you go. Wow. Alright, main battle tanks. We'll do that too then. And then APCs. We'll do that too. And then uh, over there. Lots of cast. Followed up with National Food Dole. And then after that, we will go ahead and do just rewards. Russia, like the rest of Eurasia, has always had haves and ha or haves and have nots. This fact is not part of a grand devious scheme by merchants, it is simply the truth. Why should a man who assembles guns or a peasant who works the fields be more worthy than those who keep our nation running properly? The Eurasianist elite is a core of our nation. They are brave, honest, loyal, everything our guide has come to expect from them, but they are still just men. Temptation can worm its way into even the most valiant of hearts. Reminding them of the value inherent in following our ideals should keep them happy and free from Atlantis' corruption. Should, but you never know. And I'll go for days left. And we'll do na promote natural values. So we get more monthly population and more popularity of your na ultra national sentiment. Cool. Hey, there we go. Oh, maybe we should stop training then. There you go. Go right on in. You should do more than fine down there. More than fine. But you know what? Sometimes our divisions just are just god awful. They they were do they did the last in there too. Meals for free Eurasians. Although the apartment had been freed from the control of the hated Aryan Brotherhood, it, the scars of its long occupation remain. Much of the city was still badly damaged and economic activity was still low. Well, which correspondingly meant that many of the Brotherhood's former slaves, now officially citizens, had little opportunity to improve either their own situation or that of their families, for those who still had them. As such, it was identified as an excellent target for the first wave of the nation's or the state's national food bank program, showcasing the benefits of Eurasian ideology and its collective principles. The trucks arrived early in the morning, initially escorted by soldiers, and proceeded to the abandoned storefront in the city's central district. Long years spent under the Brotherhood had encouraged a wariness of military convoys and at first few approached to inquire as to the formation's purpose. Once encouraged to approach, however, and once the workers explained the purpose, news spread quickly. Before long, thousands of citizens, for whom minimal food had once been only given in response to hard work, had arrived, although the food itself was basic, consisting of only grains and vegetables. It was filling, nutritious, and most importantly, free of charge or exchange. By the end of the day, the many hungry and unemployed uh, had been fed and, mo and, most importantly, were extolling the many positive virtues of the Passionaries Revolution and its, their guide, and their guide. Both were very pleasing outcomes. A free man deserves a daily meal of the staples. Now, we're struggling here very badly. Be uh, just because, wow, we call it 26,000 of them. Because they're literally doing last stand here too. Which is insane. Th th they literally died because they're doing the last stand. So, and you know what? They did it again. So, I'm not going to tolerate that. So, if they want to do last stand, they will do force attack. And we'll kill them all off as we see fit. Ah, uh, integrate these places. Good. And then we'll do promote national na natural values, purity, loyalty, strength. These are the core values of Eurasian superethnos. What they are sets apart from the Romano Germanics and Atlanticists. Those inferior peoples have been corrupted by their own modern value systems, spiraling ever downwards through destruction. They betrayed the ancient traditions of humanity in favor of invented systems, and that will be their end. Eurasians need know nothing more than this simple fact. The peasants and workers toil. The soldiers fight and their elites rule. It has always been that way and will always be. Nobody needs to think or act above or below his station. And, oh, that's not us. Would you guys like to go in? How many have we lost? A thousand versus thirteen thousand? That's too many still alive. Just rewards and promote natural values. Good. Support weapons? Good. Get even better support weapons. Happy 1968, everyone. Hope you're having a great, great year. Kill them off. Literally just kill them all off. A newly opened door after it gets better trucks. Let's grab some of that first up. By the order of the guide of the Passionaries Revolution, see attached about the status of your natural resources. That darn telegram haunted Anton. And so was essentially a cease and desist order. Effective immediately, Anton's oil fields and refinery would be nationalized under the state of Eurasia, and all workers would be under the jurisdiction of the government. It was effectively out of a job, out of income, and no longer had any net worth. 
What would he tell his wife? That her and her kids would become nothing more than passionary bootlickers? That he let out our livelihood go without a fight? In rage, he almost tore the telegram, but instead slammed his desk in a potent rage, throwing the telegram across the office. Gosh darn, uh, bad words, bad words. Uh, nationalists, just uh, bad words. I kept my mouth shut when they invaded. I kept my mouth shut when they asked for oil to fuel their tanks and trucks. And I kept my mouth shut when they offered me party membership. Anton was about to cry, perhaps for the first time in a long time. He did not cry as a young boy when his father was killed in the Great Patriotic War. He did not cry when his best friend left home to feed to head to the Aryan Brotherhood. And he did not cry when his third child died suddenly in the crib. But now it seemed there was no other choice until he saw another attachment to the telegram. A check, one for double what he was making, and another offer. One for a job. Unable to believe what he was being offered to him, Anton quickly dialed the Office of Resource Management and waited patiently for his secretary to pick up. Finally, the ringing stopped and a party secretary answered the call. Hello, this is Anton, and I'd like to say or call. Cool. Let's see this one next. Modernize resource extraction? Yes, please. Kill them all off. Every single last one of them. They will not defy us. If you'd like to do about better industrial equipment, please go right ahead as well. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Kill every single last one of them. We only have 30 or 27 divisions. 28 divisions. Oh, hello. Vasilevsky. Okay, cool. He won. And Cheetah's over here too. The false star, of course. And we'll integrate those places very quickly too. Cool. We could do this one, but... Uh, yeah, we're kind of okay for now. We can prepare for war. I want to get that so we get those extra bonuses. But then, a special Russian truth. Western influence critics, most of whom are now where they belong, have decried Eurasianism, claiming that it wishes to establish a permanently unequal society. They say that strangling the middle class prevents economic growth. They say that the peasants and workers are kept in the dark by censorship and political repression. They say that the military is little more than an Asiatic horde designed to destroy our enemies rather than defend the people. All these accusations are true, and a darn good thing too. Why should peasants or laborers be allowed to rule? Why would we allow merchants to become the dominant class? Why would we constrain our glorious army? As we have emphasized countless times, Western ideas of equality are farcical, anti-Russian, and a threat to all that we hold dear. And we'll do this once, we'll do this up last. But, the military union. Eurasia's ethnicities have a shared military tradition, one of ruthlessness, ferocity, and unyielding courage. The ancient hero Attila embodied this best. He drew together the Hun, Goth, Avars, and other Eurasians, successfully challenging the might of the Roman civilization. If you want to read about a brief academic base, please go right ahead. Attila's will, or example, will be the blueprint for Eurasia's army. Every ethnos, every native ethnos, anyways, will be included as part of a military union, a martial reflection of the super ethnos itself. Cool. Spend, spend and cut. Wow, 19 billion. That's a big number. He's going to start building a lot of cities everywhere, pretty much. That's a massive dead amount we've got. Oh my goodness. we got to build up more cities, though. Roads are nice and all, but cities are where it's at. Now, people do complain sometimes that I do make too many civvies, which is sort of true, just because it sometimes affects the military output we have. But, at this point... We make enough stuff that it doesn't really matter to me too much. And then, special ethnic stuff. Uh, we can do that one. Uh, more attack. What's this one? The Eternal Sky. Eurasia is vast, truly vast, as the blue sky overhead. Not for nothing do many step nomads revert, revere the vault of the heavens as God unto itself. Try as they might, the Germans could never hope to dominate it. The Eurasian National Air Force will be secondary only to the army achieving victory. Eurasia is far too large to police or invade with ground forces alone. We must have a large modern air force to ensure total coverage of our homeland. And the match will probably do this one too. Maximize operational range. That's not bad. Strike the steps. Uh, hegemony. Purge. Oh yeah. We lose more support and leader experience gain. But we do get more division attack, which I do like. Nice. And just keep doing the Okay, so this formation of the sock intern. That's fine. Whatever. We're not interested in those guys over there. And then we'll do the Eternal Sky. Nice. Better costs. And we'll do military passionarity. The passionarity of Eurasia is rapidly growing, but its invigorating warmth has yet to permeate our military. The officer corps are more concerned with strategy and tactics, while well, the common soldiery just wants to pay good, or good pay, and someone to fight. Our chief ideologues, working in tandem with ambitious young officers, have prepared a solution. Political officers are common in ideologically driven regimes like ours, and their effectiveness is proven. Provisionally uh, dubbed the Passionarist Commissar Corps of Eurasia, these bold and thoroughly indoctrinated men will shore up morale and propagate Eurasianist ideals among the rank and file. They will also make sure the generals don't develop any treasonous ideas, like their Bolshevik predecessors. Which is very good. Followed up with the bare minimum of diplomacy. 
We have no desire to entangle ourselves in the global diplomatic web at this time. Eurasia is still disunited, vulnerable, and to, to the insidious influence of Atlanticist ideas, not to mention direct intervention, should they believe it warranted. Best to avoid any unwanted commitments for now. Eurasia must focus on building up its inner strength before we step on the world stage. If we are fortunate, our sudden rise to power will come as a spit of a shock to our rivals. Asserting our strength with rapid conquest will certainly earn us a little legitimacy in their eyes. Eurasian skies. The pilot, as he always had, never felt more free than when he went in the sky. Once, however, that freedom had been colored no longer. A Kazakh. The pilot had grown up a peasant, but his life had been forever changed when the Soviet Air Force chose one day to use the skies over his family's farm for pilot training. He had known immediately that he would not be content with a life of farming, and though it had taken both years and many sacrifices, he had indeed reached his goal joining that same Air Force. And he had learned very quickly that the perpetrated equality of all the Soviet peoples had been a lie. Thrown into an under-equipped and under-prepared squadron, they had been savaged by the Germans during their invasion. And during the collapse that followed, the pilot returned to his farm, resigning himself to a quiet life. But the Passionary Revolution had changed all of that. He was a Kazakh, yes, but more than that, he was a Eurasian, and that dis distinction mattered. The equality that had once been denied was now freely given, and he again was given the opportunity to fly. Eagerly accepting, he found himself in short order taking to the skies above Kazakhstan above Eurasia, and he knew that he would never allow that land to be threatened by outsiders or by those who do not accept the quality or equality that was now shared. The skies of Eurasia would be open for all of its people for all time. What matters what matters nationality in this vast ocean? Also we did some comments to go through, such as uh I asked you guys yesterday, like in your in the video, how often do you guys see Comey actually win their war? And most, and you guys said like almost never. Om Comey almost always loses. And also, someone asks, why do I never move our capital to Viaca? Because we always have the option as Comey to move our capital back to Viaca. I never do it just because I just don't forget. It. I forget about it, pretty much. It doesn't really matter to me too much where our capital is. And it's a home of the Tsarist, which is sometimes good, sometimes not super good. So I don't move the capital because I forget. And I don't really care about moving the capital too much. So, because what's tried and true has worked in the past, so it'll work for us in the future. That's going to be my other explanation as well. So, it is what it is. And we're building up more, much more civvies. But then, we're going to do the bare minimum of diplomacy and militia, military passionarity. Very good, very good. Oh, we won't get this one too. Oh yeah, army professionals will be very nice. So, specialized ethnic regiments. History informs us of that different ethnoses have different ways of fighting. Step peoples are cavalrymen, of course. We Russians are best suited to be infantrymen. The natives of Siberia, used to be used to living off the land, make excellent light infantry. Simply assigning soldiers to regiments based on Western organizational standards is an exercise in futility. We should establish our formations based on what has traditionally worked best for each respective ethos. We should also make sure that they are properly segregated, of course. We get segregated regiments, which gives us more non-core manpower, more division organization, less recruitable population factor, but better division recovery rate, but not by much, but it'll still be good to have. And instructing the foreign minister. As you well know, Dimitri, Eurasia cannot only rely on foreign powers. That is plain as day. It is vital that we overcome our difficulties through our own strength, and once united, we will possess the might within ourselves to overcome any challenge. Accepting foreign alliances will only serve to diminish that strength and the nation. Your job as chief of the foreign services will therefore not not to seek or aid or make friends in the long term. Even support uh, obtained unconditionally will serve to weaken the nation. Your task will not to be meddled in the affairs of other countries. In our history, such entanglements and adventures have often proven ruinous for the nation. What you will do is to make the world recognize us as the legitimate rulers of Eurasia. I also want you to formalize communication with the other great powers, our neighbors, and select partners for limited trade. That is what Eurasia needs. Is everything clear, Dmitri? Yes, Lev and Nikolaevich. Very good. Now we've got three things here left. Three things. Very nice. We have so much PP. Play to our strengths, though. As a nation lacking in large and accessible coastlines, Eurasia would gain little from attempting to directly imitate existing superpowers. Doing so would also be a betrayal of Eurasianist ideals. We are a nation best suited to land-based warfare. The army should have primacy in all military affairs, with the air force and navy as second concerns. Additionally, our military doctrine should emphasize what has worked best for us in the past, attrition warfare, scorched earth tactics, and strength in numbers. Eurasia's army must be defined by its history, just as the state itself is. Very good. Let's see, doing some resource extraction. Do we need resource extraction? We can do some rubber, I suppose. Uh, let's grab that from the Republic of Ceylon. Because why not? Because why not? Can we actually do that well? No? Hmm. Japan? Japan would oh, always like us, right? We definitely need more civvies, though, which is not very good. I played our strength, and maybe we'll end with reading two more focuses, shall we? Good. A bonus for land auction? Nice. We'll do encourage the hero ethic. 
Uh, ooh, Eurasians in general share something great, like the Saxons and Vikings are super ethnos, is possessed of a heroic spirit that draws us to conquest and great ma martial deeds. Our soldiers must constantly be reminded of their superiority to the foreign peoples of the world, and especially to Atlanticists and Romano-Germanics. Our new political officers will be instructed to focus on instilling aggression in their men. To kill for one's nation is a great deed. To kill for the super ethnos is a height of heroism and jolly cooperation. Alright, man, here's a play. I want our Comey scouts to rush forward and get his eyes on the enemy. You guys are not to engage. Just keep us posted on what you see and stay out of sight if you can. As they advance, our infantry will pull back and let our riders take them from the flanks. Should be simple enough. Any questions? Our resounding no, sir, came from the Comey scouts and the infantry, who are largely Russian. The Tatar riders, on the other hand, remain conspicuously silent. Hey, cavalry, do you have any questions before we proceed? The riders remain silent for a time until one of them sheepishly stepped forward. Sir, you wish us to rush forward and attack? His Russian was broken and heavily accented. No, no, no. I want you to attack when we pull back. The riders smiled. Ah, we run back and then attack. Bringing a hand to his mouth, the captain realized what was going on. Do do you guys actually speak any Russian? Russians? Yes, the rider exclaimed, turning to give one of the Russian infantrymen a salute. And thus the captain's suspicions were confirmed. He had long come to realize the importance of maintaining national passionarity through revival of the Eurasian languages, but did not think the state would neglect to teach them even basic Russian. For crying out loud, find me someone who can speak Tatar. And we'll finish off with Purge the Atlanticist Weakness. The Germans accomplished at least one thing before their fall. They managed to rid their soldiers of weak Atlanticist notions of rules of engagement and proper military conduct. The manner in which our soldiers conduct themselves should, should, must be pure and full of Eurasian spirit. We should make sure that they aren't faint-hearted and unwilling to do what must be done for when the time of war comes. The German spheres, referring to us as barbarians, spreading lurid propaganda about the Russian propensity for slaughter, rape, and pillage. But this is just a matter of perspective. The Slavic way of war, inherited from our Hunnic and Mongol forefathers, is to fight with the utmost ferocity and see that all brave warriors are rewarded appropriately. Uh, any who balk at such things are simply in need of some re-education, but I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you're new like I always say. Uh, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow when we will probably go to war with the Kazakh Soviet social state and maybe even the Far Eastern lands. Thanks for watching, and have a great, great rest of your day.